we're going to get started in about 30 seconds. We're going to see if we can see it. Jennifer, can you sit up Stop and reach out to the thing on right. 
usually I do not present anywhere without having people stop, think, and write. Period. It's the way I've taught my class, advanced ways of literature and composition for many years and writing and English lit. Um, you just had to write if you're part of my class. As a matter of fact, um, I hope your tier one requires more writing. I think there should be more writing happening in schools. My wife is a, um, uh, is a calculus teacher um, and she talks about the importance of writing in her class. So I think writing should be infused in all of our subjects and I would encourage you to do that. So whenever I present, whenever I teach, I usually find an opportunity for people to write if we're expecting students to do that. I always say I think I should do it with adults. Um, but a couple of rules of engagement real quick. One is we're in this together. I mean, I do not want to send the impression that you, have, you are sitting in front of the guru on stakeholder engagement. That is not, that's not the case, right? My hope is that we can learn from one another. Uh, I try to do I try to do this for many, many years and continue to try to do it, as you'll see. Um, but I don't feel like all the answers are out here. We're in this together. Um, let's support one another. Um, the other is we're all honing our skills to lead, um, which I think requires some level of vulnerability. I talk about it all the time with my students. It's hard to lead without being vulnerable. It's hard to lead effectively without being, being vulnerable. And so what that sometimes means is saying, I don't know how to do something, or I was unsuccessful in doing something. And I just don't think we do enough of that in education. We talk as though we figured it out. And, um, but I want us to be a little vulnerable, so if there's, there are areas that you're struggling, struggling as it relates to this, uh, let's expose those. And I can tell you some of my struggles also because this is such an important topic. Um, get to know your neighbor. You know I'm big on coming to your neighbor. Um, so if you're not sitting, if you're sitting beside someone you don't like, you better appreciate me because um, I'm going to have you talking to them. But if you're sitting beside someone you don't like, stay there. Maybe you can fix that for well. <laughs> All right, and then this is a snapshot of a video can't end here. What I mean by that is pretty obvious. Um, this is just a conversation that I'm hoping will be an ongoing conversation for you. Uh, I'm big on journaling. Raise your hand if you if you journal, if you personally journal. Okay. Not a lot of people. Let me say something about that for just a second. Um, so I've been blessed and I've been in education for 30 years. I started my first year of teaching September 1989, that is literally 30 years ago. I stepped into J.P. McCaskey High School in front of a group of high school students. I was probably 22. As a matter of fact, I was standing in front of students who came up to me and said, how old are you? I was like, why do you want to know? They're like, and I would tell them after asking them that. They said, I've got a sister who's 18, 19, 20, you're 22. Yeah, I started very, very young. Um, and so after 30 years, one of the things that I have found is that learning as a leader happens at any time. It doesn't just happen in a classroom when I'm learning about leadership. It happens when I'm reading an article. It happens when I'm looking at the news and, look, and looking at an election. It happens when I'm in service, when I'm in church. I, I have these revelations about leadership. Leadership just happens. And so one of the re ways I have captured that so that I could then apply it was to write about it and journal about it. I can take you to my home. I have a stack of journals that are about this time. If it were standing, sitting on this time, we could have this up. Just because I reflect on, think about, and write about experiences that I ultimately want to turn into how I do. Right? So I'm assuming this is a leadership experience, not just around the content around NTSS, but around effective leadership. So 
I would encourage you to consider journaling as you evolve in your leadership. It's not that complicated. You don't have to feel like you have to do it constantly. You have to do it every single day. But I think it has, for me, at least me, been tremendously impactful. All right, here's the agenda. Um, why stakeholder engagement? We're going to actually start off journaling. Okay, so we're going to start today. Um, you can journal by typing. You can journal by writing. You can journal by drawing. Uh, I, I know people who draw. Give me one second. If I were to open up this journal, you would see that there are a lot of visuals also. It's not, it's not just writing. It's um, making sense of things through bubbles, through arrows, through narrative. Um, a lot of decisions and a lot of ideas come as a result of leaders being reflected individually. And so when I ask you to journal, don't go like this, spend a lot of time writing, writing about it. But we're going to start the journey. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about engaging at all levels. Um, some of what I'm going to talk about when it comes to engagement um, has to do with how I have worked over time to build stakeholder engagement at different levels. And I'll explain what I mean by that. And I mean at the sort of individual classroom school level, district level, even at a national level. My hope is that as you hear some of those things, you will bring, take, have takeaways. We'll talk a little bit about Collective Impact, which was an article. Um, I, I, I encourage people to read different uh, articles. And this Collective in, Impact, I think, was a powerful article both about engagement. I'll say something about education ecosystem, which is some work that I'm doing at Harvard around how to think about stakeholder engagement internally. And then we'll just take a few minutes to sort of reflect. Um, all right, this is the journal in part. Get something to write with or type. This is on you. I'm going to give you a few minutes to do this. Here are the questions that I want to start off with. When I was a teacher, <coughs> we started every class with a journal. Uh, it, may, it, may, it may have been about what they read last night, um, or it may have been about something that's going on. World today, but we started all the very fast. Here, here are several questions I want you to take on, and I'm not going to give you a long time to do it, maybe six or seven minutes. Um, first question is why stakeholder engagement? Why do this in your view? Why is this important? Let's level set on that. The next one is uh, what's your greatest stakeholder engagement challenge or opportunity right now? Like you're in here. Why? Is it because of a challenge? Is it because of an opportunity? Is something you're trying to figure out what to do? The third is what have you done or are planning to do to address the challenge or the opportunity? So I wanted to, my sense is people didn't all of a sudden just, you're not just trying to figure this out. You're, you're doing this in some way. I want to hear some of that. I want you to put it on paper. Um, and then what have been some of the struggles? What has not worked? All right? So those are the four questions that I'm going to give you about, I'm going to say about six or seven minutes. All right, go to it in any way that you see fit. You can draw it if you like. <coughs> oh, yes. I'm going to leave the questions. They, they disappear on their own. Let's see. Is you good? Someone can help me. So while we're fixing it, the, the questions are why? Why stakeholder engagement? Um, what's your, there we go. What's your greatest stakeholder engagement challenge or opportunity? There we go, hopefully they'll stay. Go to it, seven minutes.
hear me without this? Okay. So I want to capture just a few of the why. I'm going to go through the questions and just hear from you real quick and just capture some of them. We probably won't get to all of them, but hopefully a couple of them. A, a why. Like, why do you do this? Something you can just raise your hand and go on. Yes. We're talking about, you know, it's not it's not an option, right? You can't you can't do this alone. Um, I, I thought about that word engagement a lot, and that's a really important word. It's not, you know, engagement implies that you care about something. Uh, right? It's, 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 uh, it's different. So I, I think that's why engagement is, is the big key. Great. Love that idea of caring. The suggestion that you can't do it alone is absolutely positively spot on. Um, Sometimes we are accused, we being educators, are accused of living within our small boxes, whether it be a classroom or a school, and feeling like all the work happens there. But getting beyond that belief and understanding the, the work happens not just where we are, but where kids are, and they're not always with us, is tremendous. Thank you. Yes? Um, trying to execute someone else's vision is really hard. Say a little more about that. Thank you. 
But one is these are core components of building trust. So if you're trying to build community, if you're trying to build trust with community stakeholders, if you're trying to build trust with teachers, if you're trying to build trust with internal stakeholders, he suggests that there are four things that you have to work on in order to get those things done, or you have to ensure. One is competence. Hard to build trust if you don't know how to execute. Hard to build trust if you don't know how to follow through. Competence. People have to believe that you can get the job done. It's hard for you to build trust with others if you don't believe they can get the job done. So competence is good. Two <coughs> is personal regard. I'm already talking about engagement, by the way. Personal regard. What does that mean? That means people are more inclined to trust people who acknowledge who they are personally. If you've got, Chris, when's your birthday? December the 7th. If I'm Chris's leader and I know his birthday is December the 7th and I find out that it's December the 7th, if I simply say when that birthday comes, Chris, happy birthday. Congratulations. Way to go. Hope you have many more. Just by acknowledging him personally, if I heard something went on in his family or something that was challenging in his family happened, if I come to him as a leader and or as a partner and I say to him, Heard what happened to your family, just want you to know we're thinking about you. That begins to build trust. To not do that is also to erode trust. I found this out when I was a principal one day, and it caused me to come up with a statement that I'll share with you. I had a teacher come, I'll get to the, the next two. I had a teacher come up to me, uh, as a principal at a school, this 1,300 people school, high school. Big high school, urban high school, 100 and some teachers. Teacher came up to me one day, uh, I think it was a Friday, it was a busy day, and she asked if she could leave because something was happening, there was ha something happening for her daughter at her elementary school, and she didn't want to miss it. I think she was recognized for something. She didn't want to miss it. She came to me as the principal to ask if I could find her coverage. Friday, it was a hectic day, deep down in my heart, I didn't feel like I could afford to have her leave because I had to find coverage for her, but it just, it hit me in a moment that this is her daughter. This is her daughter. This is her daughter. And I said, after contemplating just a minute, I said, we'll find you coverage. Go celebrate your daughter. And then a statement came to me, and I, I share this with my students. It's a quote that I want to uh, throw it out to you, remember. And that is, cherish the person, challenge the employee. In your organization, you have individuals, and they're both employees and they're people. They are people. And acknowledging the personhood of the person is just as important as acknowledging the employee. We're talking about engagement, right? And what Anthony Bright said, says is that personal regard is critically important for building trust. Building trust is critically important for engagement. All right, the third one, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, <laughs> respect. One way to erode engagement, erode trust, is not to show respect, right? So competence, personal regard, respect, and the final one is integrity. Right? So one of the things we could be saying from this stakeholder engagement session is if trust is critical, one of the things we have to be working on in order to build trust and build engagement for these four things. Competence, personal regard, respect, and integrity.
identity. Sometimes they become harder for the people who don't reflect our way. And it's one of the places where we have to work really hard to build trust. 30 seconds, talk to your neighbor about what I just said. Does that make sense to you? Is it true? Is it like, nah, I don't know if I believe that. 30 <laughs> seconds, talk to your neighbor. That's a big point. I just dropped the bomb. I want you to make sure you're filling tickets. Go ahead. skills of stakeholder engagement is active listening um, and uh, just being able to hear what people are saying. Um, but at the same time, I think it's important for people to understand clearly what I believe about kids, right? Um, I think being authentic in that way is tremendously important. You give an example that is around perspective being different. Um, there, are, I, What I was thinking about when I first posed it was identity difference in race, in class, in culture. That oftentimes is a difficult place to begin to build trust. But probably one of the most important. Right, so if there's one thing we want to talk about here today, and we will, is how to build trust across differences that way. Mindset is tremendously important also, but also just the identities that we reflect. 
just want to call that out and just say that that's one of the reasons why I think it's important to look at sort of frameworks to think about how to build trust um, in many different ways. Um, I'm not going to spend much time with uh, what have you done all the way. You, you've been able to share. Uh, can we hear just one or two of what's worked for people? Like when you try to do this, what's something that has worked for you? Yes, thank you, Mike. Great. So transparency, particularly with notes and artifacts that have come out of experience. Tremendously important. Another thing that seems to have worked. Yes. Having people who have really clearly different opinions together. Yeah, I'm gonna repeat that. She said having people I'm assuming come together with really different opinions. So being intentional about making sure those who we engage don't just have the perspective that we have. Right, so to your point back here, having someone in a meeting who has a different, different perspective and having invited that person goes a long way in building trust and building stakeholder engagement. Makes it a little more difficult you have to be a really good facilitator. You have to have really good structures and agendas and say, this is how much time we're spending on this. This is how much time we're spending on this. But we're going to make sure that everybody's here. <coughs> Not easy, but tremendously important if you're moving this work forward in an engaging way. Yes, so, Andrew. Uh, not losing sight of the goal. Um, and, but, so, sorry, Rachel, I think you can that goal and it's not like a variable. Yep. Thank you so much, Andrew. So let's just call it out flexibility. If you're hard, fat, and this is one thing that I've learned that was a tough learning for me, particularly in my early days of leadership. Can I confess? Can I confess something to you guys? I promise not to go out and blast me about this. And I pray no one's, <laughs> she said, I'll try. Um, I pray no one's still doing this. But if you are, let me disabuse you of doing this. Whenever I had to move something forward as a leader, and it started when I was a choir director. Because when I was a choir director, I was the director, director in charge. And so I had this vision of the way you create a plan is by you going somewhere, I'm a hard worker, spending some time, spending a good bit of time of creating that plan, and then coming and presenting it to everyone. Look what I have created. And then, Andrew, people are like, but why are we doing that? And that doesn't make sense. And I started to be like, oh my goodness, you don't know how much time I spent on this thing. This was early on in my leadership, right? But being flexible around, you know what? Here is, oh, as a matter of fact, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you a, a framework to think about it in relationship. Thank you so much for this point. But flexibility suggests, here is what we're trying to accomplish. This is the goal. I'm somewhat agnostic on all the things that it's going to take us to get there. I am not agnostic on the goal. I am a little open, quite a bit open, on the how we get there. Help me get there. That's what Andrew is suggesting. So that, that authentic, that authentic, excuse me, flexibility is critically important. Um, you had your hand up. Yes. Two things she said. Choice. Everybody say choice. Choice. And then she said, giving them the opportunity to preserve. Stakeholder engagement means leaders 
stepping back a little bit. You become the facilitator. You ensure that the conditions, the environment is set so that people feel welcome to come. No matter what they pers their perspective is, they can know your perspective, but they feel they have to feel welcome to come and get theirs. Right? Tremendously important. And then you, you, she added also um, that they actually present and share. All good, good feedback. We haven't even really, well, we're into the session. Um, let me give you a framework really quick. Um, this framework, this is not what I plan to do at this time, but this is spot on with some of the feedback that you're getting. This framework I learned about when I was at the Bill and Linda Gates Foundation. And I went to a training for leaders. Um, and these trainings are usually Microsoft style trainings. So they, 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 I guess, pulled them out or tried them at Microsoft and then they brought them into the foundation. And they were often very helpful. This one was tremendously helpful. Um, and it's related to this notion of flexibility. And I think it's relevant when it comes to stakeholder engagement. If there's one thing you get from this session, get this. Hopefully, we'll get give you some other things too. Um, basically, the presenter said something about what they were learning from assessments on how people felt their managers were doing. And I was a manager. I was deputy director of the foundation, so I oversaw, oversaw quite a few people. And so they would do these assessments, they would do these um, surveys. Incidentally, that is a great way to tell how your stakeholder engagement is going, whether you have some type of survey that gives people an opportunity to get feedback, whether it's internal employees or parents or whomever. If your system has a survey for people to talk about whether they feel engaged, that's a powerful tool. In Boston Public Schools, they have the insight survey. It's given to teachers, it's given to parents, it's given to students. That type of tool is tremendously important. We can have conversations about this stuff all the time, but unless you hear back from the uh, stakeholders on an ongoing basis, it's hard to do anything about it, right? So back to the Gates Foundation session. They said to these, <coughs> to, to those of us who were uh, managers, they said sometimes we're hearing that those who work for you are frustrated because they don't know where you are on a particular idea. They don't know what your position is on a particular idea. And so they spend a lot of time sort of tiptoeing around the leader because they're not sure where the leader is. And so they encouraged us to use a tool, which I want you to consider using, especially as you begin to do stakeholder engagement. The first thing that they said is, let people know what is just a notion for you. What do I mean by a notion? Meaning, as your leader, I have an idea about how what we're going to do in this particular area, but it's just notional. This sort of represents a cloud, right? It's just notional. It's not really solid. This is what I'm sort of thinking, but I don't have a lot of evidence and I have a lot of research. I haven't thought about it deeply, but this is a notion for you. All right? So everyone say notion. They said, but then there are things that are more than just the notion. They are, that's supposed to be a stake. It's a really bad stake. They are a stake. You put a stake in the ground. Let's say that's the ground. Put a stake in the ground around a particular position. Now, with stakes, they can be pulled up depending upon how deep they are. But they are more than notions. I might have a little more evidence. I might have spent a little more time thinking about it. It's a stake in the ground. That I'm taking a position that this is the way we're going to do something. Right? Now, if you bring more evidence or you bring the perspective, you bring other people, you may be able to pull that stake and move it. So I'm putting the stake in the ground. The other one is a boulder. Boulder, much heavier to move. A lot more evidence. I spent a lot more time thinking about this. I spent a lot more time reflecting, getting other people's perspective. This is a boulder. It might be moved, but it's not gonna be easy. You're gonna have to bring a lot more evidence. You're gonna have to bring other people who are in your position. 
this is where I am related to this. And then the final one, let's see if you can figure out what this is when I draw it. I'm not the best artist. This is a tombstone. <laughs> and basically what you're saying here is I'm going to die on this hill. Over my dead body. <laughs> I love that framework. And I start using it. Right? And to your point about stakeholder engagement, there are, there are things that you might say to people, you know what? When it comes, one of my tombstones... I'm, I'm happy to have everyone in here. But one of our tombstones, one of my tombstones as a leader, is all kids can learn. Period. You're not going to change me on that. All kids can learn. We have a responsibility to ensure that all kids are, can learn. Now, there are some other things that I just have notions around. I'm not quite sure whether we should be doing it this particular way. There are other things that I have put a stake in the ground. You may be able to move me. When you begin to engage with stakeholders, it is important for them to understand where you are in this continuum. And if everything is a tombstone, you're not going to have very many stakeholders for a very long time. I suspect very few things are tombstones. A lot more are notions and stakes. All right. We are, we are deep into this session, and I, I'm appreciating your... your uh, Thoughts and reflections. Yeah. Great. So understand a few things. When I speak, I speak from the perspective of teacher, principal, assistant superintendent, deputy director, and at every single one of those levels, stakeholder engagement has been tremendously important um, for me. I should stand over here. Um, Starting with the classroom. I, would, I think one of the most important ways I was able to do stakeholder engagement, and I don't know how, to, I, I don't know if this is done here, but I certainly would encourage it, particularly at the classroom le level, particularly with parents um, in community, is through home visits. Teachers visiting homes. Educators visiting homes. When you talk about trust, building trust, when you talk about building trust with people who don't always reflect every portion of our identity, I can't think, at least in my experiences, a more powerful way to do that than to walk into a person's home who has a child that I teach. I did this as a teacher, I did it as a principal. As a principal, we did it over the summer. And I was, we were able to find some money. The super, superintendent was able to find some money. And we actually paid teachers. We paid teachers to do home visits. How many people have done something or heard of that? Oh, awesome, awesome, awesome. Finally important to build stakeholder engagement, at least on an individual level, with parents and communities, I have seen by stepping into the homes of children. It shows vulnerability on your part. It shows your desire to bridge a gap between the school and the family. And it, it actually creates a relationship between the parents and the teacher and the children before you even start school. The way we did it, I'll just say real quick, is we did it over the summer. Um, I think we, we, we actually gave the class list that a teacher was going to have coming into the year to the teacher. We gave them the addresses. We gave them training. Everyone say training. training. Please don't just send them to the house. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. We actually made, we actually built a partnership with one of the faith-based organizations in the community to come train our teachers about going to visit the families. You can't assume that your that every all of your teachers are going to be comfortable stepping into the homes of families whose identities don't 
they are not reflected in their identity. So we talked about this stuff already. But powerful, powerful. Just had a, a student who is now the engagement director for all of Richmond Public Schools. And in Richmond Public Schools, they're doing this very thing. Let's try, I would encourage you to find ways to move in that direction. Not always easy, but powerfully done. Of course, you can't force parents or teachers to do it. Um, but the bridges I, that are built as a result of those partnerships and relationships are uh, tremendously powerful. Um, turn to your neighbor real quick. Um, 30 seconds. I'm going to end with time. 30 seconds. What do you think are some of the risks of doing that? Because we sometimes don't talk about that risk. What are some of the risks of doing this? Real quick. Real quick. 30 seconds. stakeholders within the community. 
Um, is Alfreda Harris. Because Alfreda Harris, one of the most sort of vocal and powerful political um, she's a school board member, uh, but a real voice for the community. And so we had to figure out ways to connect with people who had voices, who knew the voice of the community. Private industry council was another group that we engaged with. Faith-based organizations. All of these organizations became key bridge builders for us as we were moving a strategy forward in the city. My question for you, as you're moving this strategy forward, as you're moving MTSS forward, or any strategy to move forward in, in your system, is who are the bridge builders in your community that will help you build bridges between children, parents, and the work that you're ultimately trying to do? Who are those bri bi uh, bridge builders? We were also doing this at a national level, right? So um, I think a group that we have to think more intentionally about in terms of engaging them early, we talked about this a little earlier, are teachers, right? We assume sometimes that they're automatically on board with what we're doing, or they're automatically going to move it forward. I would encourage us to pause and be more intentional about bringing teachers in. And it's one of the things that we work to do, um, even at, the, at a national level, um, through an effort that, um, just write down everyone right, ECET2, ESET2. What I would encourage you to do is go online at some point in time and look up ESET2. ESET2 stands for Elevating and Celebrating Effective Teachers and Teaching. And I often show this effort because when we were at the foundation, one of our goals was to engage teachers nationally. And we ended up engaging teachers at a pretty deep level <coughs> nationally in a really powerful way. But it started with just engaging them sort of on an individual basis in one state. Right? And so if you look up ESET 2, Elevating and Celebrating Effective teachings and teach, Teachers and Teaching, you will find some of the strategies that we use to engage teachers in the work that we were trying to do. And that was being done at a national level. If it can be done at a national level, it can be done at a local level. What's your point? My point is, don't just assume. Don't just assume the teachers are going to do it. Don't just assume they understand it. You have to be intentional. I would encourage you to be intentional about a strategy that engages them deeply. It probably also involves teacher leadership. It probably involves engaging with specific <coughs> teachers who then become the leaders of other teachers. All right, so ESET 2. The other thing I was gonna say about um, ESET 2 is that we created these uh, sort of six ingredients, these core components for why we were engaging teachers and what we were going to do as we tried to engage them. I'll just let you read them. I won't read them to you. Just look at them. Our why. That number five is tremendously important. We were looking for ways to have teachers lead. How might you find ways to have teachers lead in this effort? So that it's not just the principal leading, but or the school leader leading, or the system level leader leading. As a matter of fact, as I roll things out, I became wiser about making sure that I as a leader was speaking, but as a teacher was also speaking, and I would say that's important to do even at a district level. Just a couple more slides before you um, so I'm leading an effort at Harvard now that is all about the intersection of faith and education. I actually think faith partners, and when I say faith partners, I mean many types of faith, ecumenical faith partners, right? So not one faith, but multiple faiths, whatever faiths are represented in your community. I think we devalue their ability to be more engaged and support educational efforts. Now, obviously, it's a fine line. And I'm a huge, huge proponent of separation of church and state. But one of the things that faith organizations have is they have a lot of people who are interested in improving outcomes for children. 
You say they have a lot of people are interested in other things also, but they are very interested in improving outcomes uh, for children. Over the years, what we've been trying to figure out is how to bridge the gap between faith communities and education institutions. And I think it's tremendously important, especially for the most vulnerable communities. So this is a Pew Research Center study that's done annually. And what struck me when I was look, looking at this study is that the two populations that struggle the most when it comes to academic outcomes in this country, which are black students and Latino students, had some of the highest perceptions of faith. They hold faith in high esteem in their lives. This is historical. And so what we've been saying is, well, if faith communities are tremendously important in those communities, and those are the communities that are most vulnerable when it comes to outcomes, why aren't we connecting with faith communities in those places? And when we saw the opportunity to do that, and we saw other people doing it, it's amazing the outcomes that students are getting. And I can't go into detail around how they do it, but one of the way, one of the things that I would say is, it's always a clear line around the separation of church and state. This is not about proselytizing. This is not about pushing the faith. This is about ensuring that more resources, more social capital, is brought to bear on behalf of the most vulnerable children. So that's another thing. There are over 300,000 congregations in this country, 48,900 high poverty schools way more faith communities than there are high poverty schools. We're trying to be very intentional about how we bridge the gap between them. There are risks to all of this, separation of church and state, um, making sure that um, where it's happening, it's happening in impactful ways, um, and also not getting in, caught up into the politics of religion. All right, so I'm coming to the close. Here's what I want you to do, just for 60 seconds. On a piece of paper, what I want you to do is just reflect on what I didn't talk about much was um, the collective impact, which is what I gave you to um, read. Um, so I must say something. I want to make sure I say something about this. Um, collective impact is a phenomenal way to think about uh, stakeholder engagement. It requires a common agenda, shared measurement system, mutually reinforcing activities, backbone support organization, and continuous communication. This particular framework is spreading throughout the country. And I think creating an even more coherent way to bring people together. I would encourage you to look at it um, deeply. Here's what I want you to reflect on as we close. What are two things that you can do moving forward that you would take away from this session to do stakeholder engagement better? Just two things, just two things. Just take away from this session. It can be from someone who shared, not just me. Two things. I always think it's important to make it happen. Steps wait. Cities and fields I walk. I penetrate deserts and seas remote. And passing by Hubble and Martin Palace soon. I knock. Unbidden, 
Once at every gate, if sleeping, wake. If feasting, rise before I turn away. It is the hour of fate. And they who follow me preach every state, mortal's desire, and conquer every foe, save death. But those who hesitate, condemned to failure, penury, and woe, seek me in vain and uselessly implore, I answer not, I return no more. You have an amazing opportunity. This is a difficult topic. But what I sensed in the room, what I appreciate, is that answers are here, passion is here. Hopefully we've been able to uh, add a few more ideas and thoughts and frameworks. But I commend you on the work that you do. Thank you very much.